Hello, this is Pat Hindle, editor at Microwave Journal. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar on understanding what can affect PCB DK variation and phase consistency, presented by John Kuhnrod, Technical Marketing Manager at Rogers Corporation. Before we begin the presentation, let me cover a few items about the on 24 webinar platform. In the center of the screen, you will see a window containing the presentation. You may enlarge this to full screen to have a better view of the slide. The window on your screen labeled resource list contains a copy of the presentation, which you can download at any time. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay so you can watch it again and recommend it to colleagues who weren't able to join us for the live event. You'll find a link to the recording in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. If you have technical problems, please click on the yellow box with the question mark at the bottom of your screen. It will take you to a helpful user's guide. If you'd like to ask a question, just type it into the Q&A box on your screen and we'll address the questions at the end of the session. Please note that we have added a COVID-19 widget at the bottom of your screen that links directly to the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund for the WHO. On 24 will make a donation for each person who visits. This webinar will give you an overview of how circuit materials and circuit fabrication can, can impact the phase consistency and circuit perceived dielectric constant, or DK. Many of the newer millimeter wave applications are much more sensitive to phase variation than some other microwave applications. The circuit perceived DK is what Rogers Corporation designates as design DK. The design DK is basically a DK value of the material which is generated by an extraction process based on RF circuit performance. Variations of phase response and DK are typically assumed to be mostly related to circuit material properties and the variations. However, this assumption can be partially true, but there are numerous other things in the PCB fabrication process which can impact phase consistency and design DK. Additionally, the operating conditions and the in-use environment of which a circuit is subjected can play a role in the variations of the phase response and design DK. This webinar will cover the potential causes for phase and DK variations when using PCB technology for high frequency applications. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenter. John Coonrod is Technical Marketing Manager at Rogers Corporation's Advanced Connectivity Solutions. John has 32 years of experience in the printed circuit board industry. About half of that time was spent in the flexible printed circuit board industry regarding circuit design, applications, processing, and materials engineering. The past 18 years have been spent supporting high-frequency materials involving circuit fabrication, providing application support, and conducting electrical characterization studies. John is the chair of the IPC D24C High Frequency Test Methods Task Group and holds a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering degree from Arizona State University. Now I will turn the presentation over to John. Hello, thank you, Patrick. And uh, as Patrick uh, mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about DK variation today. And actually what I plan on doing is trying to hit all aspects of DK variation as it relates to materials, circuit fabrication, and end use um, environments and operation as well. So. I'm really gonna to try to cover a lot of topics today, and the agenda is shown here. I'm gonna first talk about high frequency circuit materials and their normal variations and properties related to the, the uh, dielectric constant. And then after that, circuit fabrication processes and how they can influence the phase response and also design DK, and also uh, talk about design DK some and define that. After that, I'll go through some common test methods. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but I just kinda of wanna give you a sense of uh, the differences in these test methods. And then finally, I'll spend some time and show data in regards to uh, influences uh, due to operating conditions and in-use environments. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So DK is a term I'm gonna use a lot for relative primitivity. I personally think the term relative primitivity is more appropriate, but I've got used to just calling it DK, and that's how I'm gonna how I'm gonna refer to it anyway. So that's dielectric constant, relative primitivity, sometimes symbol uh, epsilon sub R is used, K prime K sub. 
the bottom line, though, is DK is actually a little bit more complicated than what a lot of engineers may imagine. And um, it's really not a constant, even though the name says it's a constant. Uh, and actually, at very low frequencies, a change in frequency uh, will not change the dielectric constant. It is a constant at very low frequencies, but really in the range of frequencies that we typically are interested in, uh, such as the lower microwave range of frequencies all the way up into lower to mid millimeter wave, uh, it's really not a constant. And as the frequency increases, the natural behavior of the material will uh, just decrease dielectric constant. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we go along. Uh, and then also for dielectric constant, uh, for most of the materials used in the industry, they are not isotropic, which means the decay on the different axes of the material is not the same. And uh, that's another concern that I'll hit on as we go through the presentation today. And then also understanding um, the decay values that you see on data sheets, like if you're trying to compare uh, material A to material B in the different data sheets, it's really good to know uh, how that DK value was generated and if that was a test method using uh, evaluation of the Z-axis material and, or the XY plane. Those are usually the most common ways for the DK to be um, uh, obtained anyway. And again, we'll talk a little bit more as we go along there. Uh, and then DK tolerance, I want to talk about that real quick, and that is really specific to the test method and the formulation of the material. So each test method has their own list of uh, capabilities and limits and variables, basically, that, are, that will impact the accuracy. And because of that, uh, the tolerance for a material, for a DK tolerance, that's actually not just dependent on the formulation. It is dependent on the formulation somewhat, but it's also related to the test method. So testing the exact same material in two different test methods, you can have two different tolerances based on the test method. So that's something else to keep in mind. Uh, what I'm showing here is actually um, a chart that I got right out of a material uh, science text. And um, it's a good chart to think about the frequency behavior of dielectric constant for high frequency materials. And all materials have something called dispersion or DK dispersion, and that's basically saying the DK is going to change with the change in frequency. Now, again, at very low frequencies, a change in frequency really isn't going to change the dielectric constant, and at that point, that really is a constant. But once we get up near the lower microwave range of frequencies, that's where we start seeing uh, some other issues come into play. And it really has to do with dipole uh, moment relaxation. And what I mean by that is when an electric field is um, subjected, or I'm sorry, if a dielectric material is subjected to electric field, the dielectric materials will establish dipole moments. And as this electric field turns off, those dipole moments will also turn off and relax. As you turn the electric field on and off faster and faster, you get to a point where they do not fully relax. And because of that, um, you actually augment the electric flux, which has a effect on the dielectric constant versus frequency. And that's really what's going on here where you see from roughly 1 gigahertz out to 100 gigahertz that I'm showing that a increase in frequency is actually a slight decrease in dielectric constant. And that's normal for all dielectric materials. Uh, this more uh, steep slope that we're looking at here is not really indicative of high frequency materials. High frequency materials does have a negative slope. Uh, however, they're usually much more gentle than what's shown here. Um, and then also the <clears throat> dielectric materials are typically anisotropic, the materials used in the pinned circuit board industry, and that means basically the dielectric constant is different on the different axes of the material, and that really comes down to the material formulation and the material having a property known as uh, electric susceptibility, and the electric susceptibility is how much the dipole moments can uh, be activated or turned off, turned on, turned off by um, these electric fields being applied to the dielectric. And that uh, electric susceptibility can be different on the different axes of the material. Uh, I'm not going to go through the math here. It's really just showing uh, a tensor. And in the matrix part of this, it's usually the diagonal that we're interested in, which would be epsilon sub xx, epsilon sub yy, epsilon sub zz. Z axis is typically the thickness axis. 
And normally, the x-axis and the y-axis are very similar, and it is the z-axis that's different than the x and y-axis for most printed circuit board materials. Now, how anisotropy can be important has a lot to do with the circuit design. If it is a simple microstrip transmission line or a stub or something like that where it's not coupled, then anisotropy is usually less of an issue. If it is a circuit design where it's got coupled features like ground to or waveguide or maybe a directional coupler or what I've shown here is a section of a microstrip with uh, two signal conductors that are coupled, in that case, anisotropy can be more important. And really what's going on there is the fields are actually uh, operating in different modes. So even mode, you have electric fields between the signal plane and the ground plane. And then odd mode, uh, center picture and right picture, is showing still electric fields between the signal plane and the ground plane. But also you have electric fields coupling between the signal conductors. Some of those fields are in air, and some of those fields are using the X or Y axis of the material. And in this case, I'm actually showing the electric fields in the center picture interacting with a glass weave, and then the right picture, the same odd mode, except the fields are not interacting with the glass weave. And that's just a very simple representation of how the glass weave effect can, can uh, play some kind of role here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that much. I do have uh, a presentation on that, and uh, if anyone's interested, I can give you more details on that. Uh, but in general, uh, anisotropy is more of an issue for coupled uh, RF features than it is uh, a single single ended type of feature. <clears throat> uh, what I've shown here is a table of information for some common high frequency materials used and two different categories for dielectric constant. The design decay, which is the z-axis or thickness axis dielectric constant of the material. And then also a dielectric constant uh, that was obtained by SPDR, split post dielectric resonator. And I'll explain that test method a little bit later. But anyway, that gives us a, a, a dielectric constant for the XY plane. So comparing the z-axis to the XY plane gives you a little bit of uh, sense for the anisotropy. And as a few general statements, uh, the material that has lower decay values typically are more isotropic or they have less differences in the uh, different axis of material for the dielectric constant. Also, another general statement is the non-woven glass materials are usually more isotropic as well, and woven glass usually adds to the anisotropy. And then there's also uh, thickness variation. So depending on how the material is formulated, the 10 mil thick laminate could have different anisotropy than a 20 mil thick laminate just by the nature of how it's formulated layers of glass and different things like that. And then there is a frequency dependency to this anisotropy, which goes right along with what I already talked about with the dipole moment relaxation. And um, then all these values here are generated using test methods at the same frequency, 10 gigahertz. So um, I thought I'd go through uh, some test methods real quick, and then later I'll spend a little bit more time on them. But I just wanted to uh, show a couple of common test methods and what axis they are evaluating. And the X-band clamp strip line test, which is a very common test for uh, laminate suppliers, that is evaluating the Z-axis or the thickness axis of the material. The FSR full sheet resonance test, that's also a material supplier type of test. Z axis is being evaluated. The split cylinder test and also the split post dielectric resonator test are testing the XY plane. And this is actually a material test as well. Rectangular waveguide test, that tests the XY plane. However, you can do something here with this test method to test the X axis separate from the Y axis. It's rather a painful ordeal, but you can do it. And uh, it is pretty accurate, too. Uh, typically, we do not do that, though. And really, the reason why is because, again, the x-axis and y-axis for most materials are pretty similar for DK values. So, and also, along with that, a lot of the electromagnetic modeling software out there is asking for the z-axis dielectric constant. And when the modeling software is interested in, in anisotropy, then they typically ask for the xy plane dielectric constant and not specifically the x and y-axis. The last couple of bullets there are actually circuit testing, whereas all the previous ones were, were test methods that were uh, raw material testing. So the microstrip ring resonator, that's a circuit test, and it's evaluating the z-axis, the microstrip differential phase length, 
Uh, that's also a circuit test using microstrip transmission lines. I'll talk about both of those a little bit more. Uh, they are evaluating the z-axis, but depending on the design and the material and thickness and other things, they could pick up a little bit of XY plane infringing. Uh, but again, my last bullet down there already mentioned that most of the materials in the industry, the X and Y axis are very similar. So it's uh, usually better, and also due to test method accuracy, it's usually better to actually test the XY plane and not attempt to test the X axis separate from the Y axis. So a quick overview of material variations in regards to DK variation. And um, to begin with, the DK tolerance, as I mentioned, is related to the test method. Uh, so when you see a DK tolerance of plus or minus 0.05, that means the material is capable of that, but also there's some influence there by the test method. So just knowing that and understanding the test method uh, that can give you a little better sense that uh, sometimes you can see different DK tolerances on materials that seem very similar, and if they're using different test methods, sometimes it is test method related. Uh, and then also I've seen customers do correlations between test methods uh, that are different, and that's okay, but I typically uh, would caution engineers to not do correlations between test methods that are testing different axes of material. So if you have one test method testing the z-axis, another one testing the xy plane, uh, to do a correlation between those test methods is okay, but uh, the biggest concern I have is depending on the material formulation, there may not be a direct relationship for some materials. So some materials, when the z-axis varies by a certain number, the xy plane would vary by a direct relationship or a linear relationship. But other materials, that's not true, where the z-axis could vary different than the xy plane. So typically, I don't like to do the correlation between test methods that are testing different axes of the material. And then, of course, all materials have the property of moisture absorption. Thankfully, most of the high-frequency materials are very low in moisture absorption, but still, uh, the circuit material can absorb moisture from the, the air, the humidity in the air. And, of course, uh, water vapor is a higher dielectric constant, and it's polar, it causes more losses. Uh, so when a circuit does absorb humidity from the air, then that will have a change in dielectric constant. And then also there is a property known as TCDK, thermal coefficient of dielectric constant. That is a property that all materials have, and it is basically a property stating that with a change in temperature, you will get a change in dielectric constant. And just as a general rule of thumb, the TCDK uh, should be at 50 parts per million per degree C or less to be considered good. <clears throat> and again, that's just a, a general rule of thumb. And uh, also, I think I've already mentioned this too, but I'll hit it on it again, but most of the materials that have higher anisotropy are typically higher DK materials. And these are all kind of general rules, but I guess I would uh, kind of draw the line there about six dielectric constant or above those materials are usually more uh, anisotropic, but there are exceptions. So let's take a look at, <clears throat> excuse me, let's take a look at uh, some of the circuit fabrication issues as related to uh, dielectric constant variation phase consistency. And to begin with, I'm going to go through the, the design DK concepts. Uh, so the next few slides, I'll go through that. It's a pretty simple way of thinking of it, but it is uh, very much circuit related and how the circuit perceives the dielectric constant. So first one I'm showing here is a really simple slide that's uh, basically saying that if you have an electromagnetic wave propagating in free space and then it encounters another medium that is a higher dielectric constant, the wave does several things and basically it compresses. So the wavelength gets shorter, the amplitude's usually a little smaller, and also for speed, the wave slows down. So for the next several slides, you may want to keep in mind that a slower wave is indicative of a higher dielectric constant or a higher dielectric constant can slow the wave. And what we have found over time by doing a lot of evaluations, there are other things than the dielectric constant of a substrate that can slow the wave. And one of them is the copper surface roughness. And the copper surface roughness, what I'm talking about is that the interface between the substrate and the copper and if you were to look at the exact same material, same dielectric, same everything, and the only difference being copper surface roughness, the circuit that has the rougher copper will have a slower wave. And again, a slower wave is perceived as a higher dielectric constant, even though the dielectric constant of the material could be the same. 
And a good way to show that is a study we did several years ago, and uh, this is kind of a summary of that study. And what we did was we used the exact same material, 4 mil thick LCP, and uh, then we looked at four different copper types that had significantly different roughness. We measured the sheets of the copper using a laser profilometer, non-contact profilometer, had a obtained very good information on the roughness, and then we made the laminates, sent them off, had circuits made, and we evaluated them. Uh, it's a microstrip transmission line test it's using the microstrip differential phase length, and I'll explain that test method a little bit later. But essentially what we get on the y-axis is the effective dielectric constant, and on the x-axis is frequency. And the effective dielectric constant for a microstrip transmission line is basically saying that is the dielectric constant that the propagating wave experiences from having fields in air and substrate. <coughs> Excuse me. Actually, give me just a second. I'm going to take a little sip of water here. <coughs> All righty, that's a little better. <coughs> So what this chart's showing you is the exact same dielectric material and the only difference being copper that has different roughness. And you can see uh, that the trends are pretty distinct, that the red curve is the circuits that were tested that had the smoothest copper. The copper surface roughness was 0.5 microns RMS. The green curve is a little bit rougher, purple rougher again, and the blue was the circuits with the roughest copper at 3.0 microns RMS. And you can also see there's a pretty big difference here, a 0.3 difference in effective dielectric constant. <clears throat> and considering this is the exact same dielectric material, there is no difference in the dielectric constant of the material itself. This effect is actually due to the copper surface roughness. And again, a rougher so copper surface will slow the wave, and a slower wave is perceived as a higher dielectric constant. Now, this design decay, uh, which is kind of what I call the circuit perceived decay, uh, there's a lot of different um, dependencies, and uh, one of them is thickness, substrate thickness. And here's showing a very basic experiment I did some time ago where I had the same substrate and the same copper, same everything, and the only thing I did was make a thin laminate and a thick laminate, had the microstrip transmission lines made, tested them for the design decay, and what I found was using all the same materials that there is a pretty significant difference due to substrate thickness. And the thinner substrate had an average design decay 3.96 and the exact same materials using a thicker substrate or a circuit using a thicker substrate with the same materials had 3.68. And really, uh, to me, um, what this, what it's really telling me, and you can kind of think about this, um, you know, intuitionally, is basically it's when the copper planes are very close together in the case of um, the thin laminate, then the copper roughness is going to impact the wave propagation more than a laminate when the copper planes are very far apart. Uh, then when the copper is very far apart, the copper roughness really doesn't impact the wave velocity and you really are looking more at the intrinsic BK value of the material. So if you were to do the same evaluation on a thicker laminate, about 60 mil thick, what you'd find is this particular material, RO4350B, will have a design decay of 3.66. And if you go up to 90 mil thick, it's still going to be 3.66, uh, and on and on and on. So basically, once the copper planes are far enough apart, they really do not impact the phase velocity which means you're really um, looking at the intrinsic decay of the material, which in this case is 3.66. So here's just continuing the uh, discussion and looking at the exact same material at different thicknesses. This is using the RO3003 materials. It has an intrinsic decay value of 3.0. And in this case, we are looking at circuits that were evaluated at different thicknesses. The green curve is a 5 mil thick substrate. Uh, blue is 10 mil thick, red is 20 mil thick, and if I would have tested around 50 or 60 mil thick, I would have got a DK curve that would have settled in right around 3.0. And uh, so this kind of shows you the, um, the behavior of uh, the material at different thicknesses using the same material. And again, this is also a chart of the 3003 materials, but now it's a thin laminate, and that means that the copper surface roughness is going to play a pretty big role on the design decay, design decay is the extracted decay that's on the y-axis, frequency on the x, and the blue curve is using 5 mil thick 3003 laminate with a rough copper, 
And the orange curve is the exact same laminate, same design, same everything, except it's using very smooth copper. And you can see the smooth copper is uh, actually has a design decay curve pretty close to the intrinsic value of the material of 3.0. And it's just a little bit higher than that, and that's because this copper is so smooth that it really does not impact the phase velocity much, but it still impacts it a little bit. So <clears throat> something I've been asked several times about is the tolerance, the DK tolerance for design DK. And that's kind of a tough one to answer because there are so many uh, influences on design DK. So there's substrate thickness that influence it, there's copper roughness that influence it, the DK of the material itself and the DK variation of the material itself, there's circuit fabrication influences that can come into play as well. And then there's also frequency. So there's a lot of different ways uh, that this design DK can vary. And understanding that tolerance is uh, kind of difficult. Uh, we do have that information if anyone is interested, but it is unique to the material and the thickness and different attributes like that. But what I wanted to point out here is uh, a study that I did some time ago using the same material. This is 10 mil thick oil 4350B using the exact same substrate. The curves on the left was using the same substrate but with a relatively low profile EDE copper. It had an average roughness of 0.8 microns RMS. And the curve on the right is the same thing except using copper that was much rougher, uh, had on average 2.8 microns RMS. And just by the nature of copper roughness, um, there is normal copper roughness variation. So this variation of the copper roughness will vary from sheet to sheet, from lot to lot, and even within a sheet. And a normal, or an easy way to think about this basically is this variation is somewhat related to the nominal roughness value. And a copper that is rougher will also have more variation of the surface roughness. And you can see that by the chart on the right-hand side, using the rougher copper and using 14 different lots of copper, I get a design decay difference of 10 gigahertz of 0.118. And then using the same substrate, but smoother copper on the left curve, I get a design decay difference of 0 0.068. So uh, a, a smoother copper will allow you to have less design decay variation. And at some of the higher frequency millimeter wave applications where DK consistency and phase consistency are really important, sometimes that's really something that should be considered to use a copper that is smoother. Smoother copper will uh, help you for insertion loss, and also smoother copper is going to give you a more consistent uh, phase response as well. So let's talk about some other uh, printed circuit board fabrication issues as, relates, as it relates to phase consistency and the DK variation as the circuit would perceive it. <coughs> Excuse me. And I did a study a while back where I was looking at copper surface, I'm sorry, copper plating thickness differences. So for a circuit that has plated through hole, uh, the copper itself, the, the signal conductors and the circuit features will be plated up with that copper plating, which means the end copper thickness is going to be thicker than what the laminate is being supplied. Uh, and also, there is normal variation of copper plating thickness, and that variation is within a sheet of circuits being made as well as sheet to sheet. And that copper thickness variation can impact our performance, and some circuits are more susceptible than others. I would have to say that microstrip transmission lines seem to be much less susceptible uh, to differences in RF performance due to copper plating thickness differences, but the ground and coplanar waveguide and other coupled features are more susceptible to RF differences due to uh, copper plating thickness differences. So what I did in the study was I took a uh, large sheet, 24 by 18, of uh, 10 mil thick oil 4350D materials, cut it in half. Half the sheet had circuits made with thin copper plating, and the other half of the sheet was made with circuits with thick copper plating. So basically, I'm using the exact same material and also the exact same circuit designs, and the only difference was thin copper and thick copper. And I looked at several different designs, and two of which I'll talk about today were the tightly coupled ground coplanar waveguide and also loosely coupled ground coplanar waveguide. The microsection pictures are shown below, and uh, this is the tightly coupled ground coplanar waveguide where I had an 18 mil wide conductor on the top copper layer and a 6 mil space between the grounds left and right of the signal conductor on the top layer, the coplanar layer. 
And for the circuit with the thin copper, it had a total thickness on the final circuit of one mil thick copper. The circuit with the thicker copper was significantly thick, thicker at three mil thick for the final copper thickness. And in looking at insertion loss, and this is centered around, I think, looks like 67 gigahertz. Um, what we found was the wider conductor had the lowest loss, which kind of makes sense because a wider conductor means lower conductor losses. And also we found the wider conductor with the thicker copper plating was the best combination because thicker copper plating is also going to have some field shrinking in air, and air is the lowest loss material. Now my nomenclature or my uh, naming convention here, the W18S6 means the coplanar circuitry on the top copper layer is ground signal ground, and the W18S6 means that the signal conductor is 18 mils wide and the space between the signal conductor and the neighboring ground planes is a 6 mil space, so that's tightly coupled. And then the W21S12, 21 mil wide conductor and a 12 mil space, and that had the lowest loss due to the wider conductor and uh, with the thicker copper. Then I looked at phase response, and that turned out to be uh, a little more significant than I expected. And ground coplanar waveguide is used a lot in higher frequencies, specifically millimeter wave, because the ground coplanar waveguide will allow the designer to actually deal with a lot of millimeter wave issues, such as radiation, um, spurious modes, things like that. Uh, but ground coplanar waveguide is more susceptible to some of the circuit fabrication uh, processing. So what I did was I uh, used the phase response formula shown here and modified it to have two different links, so a differential length method. The delta L is the difference in physical length. Delta phi is the difference of the phase angle between the long and the short circuit at frequency F, speed of light C, and that's how I got the effective dielectric constant. So um, this chart is showing the response uh, from this test, and on the y-axis is the effective dielectric constant, and on the x-axis is frequency, again, centered around 67 gigahertz. The main reason that I picked that frequency is because uh, at that frequency and the range of frequency shown here is really where I had the best return loss with all four sets of circuits, and I wanted to make sure everything was as consistent as possible. So uh, looking at this data, there's several things uh, of interest. One is the red curve and the blue curve are the tightly coupled circuits, W18S6. Red curve is the lowest effective dielectric constant, and that is tightly coupled with thick copper. So basically between the ground signal ground, the sidewalls between these conductors are taller because of the thick copper. And that means that you have more fields and more concentration in error, and error is the lowest dielectric constant, of course, so that means you can have a lower effective dielectric constant. Blue curve is the exact same design except thinner copper, and in this case it makes a difference of about 0.1 in effective dielectric constant. So that's a pretty significant difference when you're talking the exact same sheet of material, and the only difference is the copper plating thickness, same design, same everything. And then the other two curves, purple curve and green curve, that is the loosely coupled circuits with uh, thick and thin copper. And here we can see differences of about 0.075 in effective dielectric constant. So when it's loosely coupled, the difference of copper plating thickness is less significant than tightly coupled. So these are some of the things to think about when you're dealing with ground coplanar waveguide at millimeter wave frequencies and how the structure can be uh, affected by normal variation of the copper thickness. Another thing that comes into play is uh, final plated finishes. And, of course, uh, the circuits that are built in, and used in the industry, they are not bare copper circuits because of, they'll tarnish over time and bad things happen. So normally uh, the copper is going to be uh, plated with some kind of protective metal or maybe covered up with a solder mask. Uh, but anyway, this protective metal, uh, there's many different kinds, and most of these metals are less conductive than copper, which means they will add to the conductor losses and cause more insertion loss. Now, in the case of microstrip, um, most of the fields for microstrip are between the signal plane and the ground plane. And at, that, at those interfaces, the uh, final plated finish cannot get to that because it's sealed in. So the final plated finish on the signal conductor is just on the left and right sidewalls and the top of the conductor. 
And if you are familiar with electromagnetic modeling and looking at some of the fields and current density, you'll see that at the side walls of a microstrip uh, signal conductor, there is a high concentration of current density. And because of that, uh, those areas are affected by the final plated finish. And you get kind of a uh, accumulative effect that if it's a short length circuit, then these edge effects due to conductivity differences of this lossy metal is less of a uh, impact. If it's a longer circuit, then this edge effect kind of adds up to give you even much more insertion loss. Now, I've had a lot of customers come to me and tell me that uh, their circuits had much more losses than what they expected. And a lot of times that's because they did not account for the uh, losses of the final plated finish and simulation. And a lot of that is due to the using a grounded coplanar waveguide. Because in the case of the grounded coplanar waveguide, you now have four areas that are affected by this lossy finish between the ground signal ground. And grounded coplanar waveguide definitely has more, uh, let's say, increased insertion loss uh, as compared to microstrip when using the same lossy finish. And here is a quick example of that. In this case, I built circuits that were microstrip transmission lines and tightly coupled grounded coplanar waveguide transmission lines on the exact same material. It's 8 mil thick, uh, RO4003C, 40, uh, and um, what I'm finding is the chart on the left, microstrip, the red curve is bare copper, the blue curve is ENIG, electrus nickel immersion gold, and nickel is about one quarter of the conductivity of copper, and it also has some magnetic loss as well. So we do see a difference of about 50 gigahertz between bare copper and EMIG for, ground, for the microstrip circuit on the left of about 0.5 dB per inch. The granite coplanar wave got on the right, the uh, same difference, red curve, bare copper, blue curve, EMIG, there's a difference of 1.2 dB uh, per inch difference. So a pretty significant difference there. Now, uh, most of the metals used in the industry <clears throat> for this plate of finish are not as conductive as copper. And I'm not going to go through this in much detail, really, because of timing. Uh, but in general, um, the only metal finish that is as conductive as copper or better is immersion silver. The other metals, such as immersion tin, electric nickel, immersion gold, things like that, they are more lossy just due to the nature of them. Gold itself is not that much different than copper. But usually the nickel, the nickel barrier that <clears throat> can be the issue. <coughs> Excuse me. So here I'm showing uh, some testing we did on uh, 5 mil thick microstrip transmission line circuits using very low loss material and very smooth copper. And the blue curves I kept all blue because they're so similar and within the measurement range uh, of this test method that I just wanted to show them all as the same. And what that is is the bare copper is the light blue and that's kind of my reference. That's as good as it gets, so to speak. And then the OSP, Organic Solidability Preservative, that had no significant impact on assertion loss. And immersion silver also had no significant impact on assertion loss. The green curve is immersion 10. That did cause more losses. Yellow is guinea pig. And red is ENIG, electric nickel immersion gold. Now, it might sound like I'm bashing ENIG, but in reality, that is a good finish. And it's used for a lot of different things. And it's used a lot in the industry. It's good for wire bonding. It's good for long-term storage. It is a good finish, but I just want to make sure the designers are aware that they need to account for this uh, finish if they're using it for uh, differences in insertion loss. Now, EMIG, electric nickel immersion gold, just like any process, does have some variability, and one of the variables is the nickel thickness itself will vary from batch to batch or even within a batch or even on the same panel of circuits. And that nickel variation does make a difference in RF performance. And in this case, I'm showing differences of uh, microstrip transmission line circuits built on 5 mil or 3003 with rolled copper. Blue curve is the bare copper reference circuit. Orange curve is ENIG with thin nickel plating. Gray curve is ENIG with thick nickel plating. And you can see there's a pretty good difference uh, in insertion loss. And this is from the exact same process. And the only difference is the nickel is on the thin side of the process and the nickel is on the thicker side of the process. And you can also see uh, by the curve here that at about 80 gigahertz, uh, we have a fair amount of losses, of course, but this is from microstrip. If you do the same testing with granite coplanar planar waveguide, uh, the scale actually shifts and it's much more significant. And that's what this chart's showing. 
that uh, the exact same material, same everything, except now this tightly coupled granite coal planer waveguide, yellow curve is bare copper, blue is e neg with thin nickel, and green is e neg with thick nickel. So if you have a granite coal planer waveguide or coupled features, could be edge coupled features for filters or whatever, uh, you need to keep in mind that they are going to see more losses due to ENIG and the normal variation of ENIG can impact this uh, RF performance of the circuit pretty significantly. Now, I've been focused in the past on insertion loss when it comes to final plate of finish, but it turns out final plate of finishes can impact phase response, and that's exactly what this is showing. This is the same testing on the last slide, but now I look at the phase response and from the phase response, I did the microstrip differential phase length method and extracted the DK on the y-axis, frequency on the X, and the gray curve is bare copper circuits, blue is the E-neg with thin nickel, and orange is E-neg with thick nickel. So you can see for phase response and how it relates to the extraction of DK that the nickel thickness difference is uh, pretty significant, actually. Now, another thing comes into play is this plated finish does have an effect on test vehicles sometimes, and uh, one test vehicle is used a lot is ring resonators, and what I'm showing here is uh, from the same study where we looked at ring resonators on these, uh, these different panels, and uh, a difference in nickel thickness only caused a difference of 0.023 for the DK extraction. And the difference of 0.023 for DK extraction was not valid for the material itself. It actually had to do with how the nickel thickness had an effect on the gap coupled area of the ring resonator. I'll talk about ring resonators a little bit more as we go along as well. Um, this is another thing I wanted to bring up too, is sometimes people don't think about final plated finishes having an impact on thermal and thermal management, but it really does. Uh, and basically what happens is when you have more insertion loss, you will have uh, more heat being generated. And in this case, what I'm showing is two filters that are exactly the same, same design, same material, same everything. They are built on 20 mil RL4003C laminate, bare copper circuits on the left, and on the right are the circuits that had EMEG, electric nickel emerging gold, which causes more losses and causes more heat to be generated. Bare copper circuits, the maximum heat of the circuit after it came to thermal equilibrium was 152 degrees up. The circuits with EMIG, 262 degrees up. Pretty big difference. So I'll go through the test methods quickly, and just because of timing, I'm not going to spend much time on it, just more of an introduction of each of these test methods. The first one is the clamped strip line test. This is a test method that's used a lot in the industry for material manufacturers, and basically after we make the copper clay laminate, we will etch all the copper off and put it into a fixture, and the fixture will test the raw dielectric material itself. Left and right of that will be clamps to apply pressure and also act as a ground. And in the middle will be a very thin circuit that we call a resonator card. And that will be, of course, the uh, loosely coupled resonator. So this has a RF structure of a strip line that's ground signal ground. Here's some pictures of what it looks like in our lab. And um, the clamped fixture at the bottom right here is actually showing the metal clamps and then two sheets of material that's being tested, in this case a 60 mil thick or 4350B, and there's also very thin copper sheets there. And those thin copper sheets are very, very smooth copper that actually are the electrical connection to ground to the connectors below. So those big plates are actually applying pressure, but the actual ground is those very smooth copper sheets. The test method has been around for a few decades, actually. This has been around a long time. It's a very simple test method. There's not too much uh, operator dependencies or influence, so that's good. And typically what we do is measure node four. So it's designed to be uh, nodes at 2.5 gigahertz for half wavelengths. So first half wavelengths, 2.5, node one, node two, two half wavelengths at five gigahertz, then 7.5 and 10 gigahertz, node four. And you can see the formula is actually pretty simple. N is the node, so we use four usually. C is speed of light. F is the center frequency that we measure. L is the physical length of the resonator circuit itself. And delta L is the only thing that's a little tricky, and there's a routine to figure that out. But basically, that is the effect of fringing fields between the feed line and the resonator itself. 
Now the test method is FSR, full sheet resonance test, and this is the uh, test method that's kind of neat. It's not destructive, whereas the last test, plant strip line test, is destructive. We have to etch the copper off to test it. This test, you can actually determine the bad constant of a copper-clad laminate. And um, this is actually setting up uh, standing waves or resonant waves uh, on the physical panel itself. And because of that, and the panel being relatively large, um, you're going to be testing at lower frequencies, like 80, gigahertz or 80 megahertz to 150 megahertz or someplace in that range. SPDR is another one I'll talk about quickly. This test method is testing the XY plane of the material, where the previous two test methods, FSR and clamp strip line test, are testing the Z-axis only. This is actually testing the XY plane. It's a perturbation test. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, you basically test the fixture empty, and you get the baseline measurement, and then you put the material in, test it again. The shift in center frequency will be used to determine the DK, and the difference in Q or bandwidth will be used to determine the dissipation factor. And this is, again, testing the XY plane of the material, and a lot of times the combination between this test method with FSR or the clamp strip line that's testing the Z-axis will give you a good sense of uh, anisotropy for the material being looked at. The microstrip differential phase length method, this is a pretty simple test method, been around for several decades as well. This is a circuit test method, and on a panel, I will have a whole bunch of different circuits, and for this test method, I'll have a short link circuit and a long link circuit. They're exactly the same in every regards except for physical length, usually a 3 to 1 ratio or 4 to 1 ratio. We then manipulate the uh, microstrip phase response formula to account for two circuits of different length, delta L. We measure the phase angle delta, delta phi, the difference between the short and the long circuit for phase angle at frequency F speed of light C, and that gives us the measured effective dielectric constant. Once we have that, we will destroy the circuits and measure them very carefully for physical dimensions, and we will put all the dimensions into a software, and we will have the software generate what it thinks the effective dielectric constant should be, and then with the software, we will adjust the dielectric constant until the software's effective dielectric constant will match the measured effective dielectric constant, and that will be the DK value at that frequency F. And this is what we get out of that is a um, response that is DK on the y-axis and frequency on the x-axis. And this is a pretty good test method for uh, really getting a wide range response of material. I don't think it's quite as accurate as a resonator test method, um, but it is uh, good for actually looking at materials for a very wide range of getting DK across a very wide range of frequencies. So that's good. Ring resonators I'll touch on quickly, kind of running out of time. Apologize for that. Uh, ring resonators are used a lot in the industry. However, I think they should be used at lower frequencies because when they are used at higher frequencies, you have much more variables that's more difficult to really uh, accurately account for. And some of that is the gap coupling between the feed line and the ring will change as you go up in frequency. And that needs to be accounted for, which you can in field solving. Uh, but there's other things too. And things like uh, circuit fabrication and how the copper plating thickness will vary that gap. So if it's copper that's thin versus thick on one circuit versus another, that will vary the gap coupling capacitance, which will vary how you extract the DK. And then you can get a different DK than you really should based on circuit fabrication issues. And then also this uh, plated finish variation, this trapezoidal effect variation, this sort of thing. And then there's also the copper surface roughness. So I've already explained that copper roughness does have an impact on the phase response and on the RF performance in general. And that's true with the ring resonator. And also knowing that the, uh, the copper surface roughness does have normal surface roughness variation, more than likely, the copper surface roughness in the signal plane is not going to be exactly the same copper surface roughness on the ground plane. So if you're trying to account for copper roughness uh, in the string resonator test, that can be a little tricky too. Now let me talk about some of the end use and operating environment uh, effects. And uh, I've already talked about TCDK some, but I wanted to hit on it again a little bit. And uh, the TCDK is how much the dielectric constant will change with a change in temperature. And unfortunately, my arrow pointing to the dark blue curve is not pointing there. I apologize for that. 
but the dark blue curve on this chart below is for 2003, which has a nearly ideal um, TCDK of 3 plus per million per degree C. Ideal would be 1.0 on the normalized y-axis, or basically zero parts per million per degree C, no change in dielectric constant with a change in temperature. And as you can see, other materials uh, most certainly do have responses where the dielectric constant will change with temperature. Now, the previous uh, picture was really testing the raw material itself, and this slide is showing testing of circuits using the microstrip differential phase length method. And two different sets of circuits. One is uh, circuits using 5 mil oil 3003, which has very good TCDK. And you can see at 77 gigahertz, we have almost nothing for differences in operating temperature. Where the blue curve would be room temperature, orange would be 65C, gray would be 125C. And across the range of temperatures, the difference we saw in performance for dielectric constant change is only 0 0.001, which is pretty much in the measurement noise. And that's about light for a material that has that good a TCDK. The really should be minimal, no change. And then the competitive materials here, that's not Rogers material. That's another competitive material. It's a PPE-based material. And some of the PPE-based materials uh, do have issues with TCDK. And this one does. It's got a pretty high TCDK of 220 parts per million per degree C. And you can see that the orange curve is room temperature. Blue is operating at 65 C. Green is operating at 125 C. And there's a pretty big difference, about 0.031 difference in dielectric constant at 77 gigahertz. And also keep in mind that difference in DK is due to temperature only. If you combine humidity with that, that also could be another factor. And actually, that's what the next uh, slides I'm going to talk about are. This one is insertion loss testing and looking at differences between a room temperature environment compared to the same circuits being conditioned at 85-85 for three days. What I mean by 85-85 is 85% humidity and 85 degrees C. And you can see in the case of the RL3003 materials, which is very low in moisture absorption, there is a little difference uh, in insertion loss, obviously, between the uh, light green and dark green curves of room temperature and after three days of testing, or after three days of conditioning, 85-85. And of course, with the 85-85 conditioning and absorbed moisture, that is going to increase the insertion loss because moisture is poor and it's going to cause more insertion loss. That same testing with the competitive material that's a PPE-based material and higher in moisture absorption, you see it has a very significant difference in insertion loss where room temperature red curve, orange curve is after three days of 85-85. The same testing and then extracting the DK on the y-axis using phase measurements is shown here for the design DK. Again, the green curves are the oil 3003 difference in Dielectric constant at 70 gigahertz is about 0 0.005, and then the PPE-based material, the difference at 70 gigahertz is uh, about eight times that, actually, at 0 0.04. So this particular PPE-based material is uh, a little bit higher moisture absorption and definitely causes some differences in the uh, dielectric constant. Now, this is the same testing except focused at 77 gigahertz, and actually this is a different test. Uh, it's the same test method. It's just I had circuits that had a little bit better return, so I could actually get good data up at 77. Uh, so the red curve and the yellow curve is the PPE-based materials, and you can see there's a phase angle difference of about 27 degrees, and that's due to room temperature versus three days at 85 degrees. And then the light green and dark green, uh, again, that is the RL3003 materials and about an 8.9 difference in phase angle. And that's really pretty good, especially at 77 gigahertz. That's a pretty small difference in phase angle, but uh, still, things to, things to keep in mind. So I know that I buzzed through that pretty fast, as I usually do. Kind of apologize for that. But I do have a little bit of time for questions, so uh, let me open it up for questions. Thank you very much, John. Excellent presentation, and as always, filled with a lot of data, so that's great. So first question, what is the effect of epoxy, epoxy potting on microstrip DK phase thermal and insertion loss? I haven't done much with that. Um, I've done some things somewhat similar, and what I find is uh, 
microscope, of course, you got the signal conductor on top, ground plane at the bottom, and the signal conductor on top, you do have the benefit of having uh, electric fields and magnetic fields, for that matter, actually using air. So you have uh, the fields using substrate and air for the dielectric, which means um, air is the lowest loss. Uh, medium you have, of course, and if you cover that up and now you have an epoxy that has a dissipation factor much worse than air, of course, then you're going to have an increase in insertion loss and more than likely you're going to have a, a phase difference too because it's not going to have a dielectric constant one as air does. Now, depending on the circuit design and the thickness of the substrate and things like that and how much fields are really fringing, that could be a pretty significant difference, and it may not be a significant difference. It has a lot to do with the design and thickness of materials and dielectric constant, things like that. But you will see more losses, and you will see a difference in phase angle when you apply the epoxy, I'm pretty sure of that. Next question, will effective DK be different for different thickness substrates for strip line traces? Uh, the effect of DK is related to microstrip, uh, where you have a difference in the, the fields that are experiencing the medium of air and substrate. In strip line, you don't have air, and uh, I'm not sure if it was just a miswording or not, but strip line, technically, you don't have an effective DK, but you can kind of sort of. So strip line, if all the substrate is exactly the same, same dielectric constant, same everything, then you have a pure TPM wave and you do not have an effective dielectric constant. But if the core material and the prepared that bonds it together has different properties, then you can get something kind of like dispersion. And I don't know if I'd really call it effective dielectric constant, maybe a composite dielectric constant. Um, but there are some differences there. And uh, back to the question, though, if it's a microstrip, the effective dielectric constant for microstrip, the fields using air and substrate, that can be different when the substrate is thick or thin or if the conductor width is wide or narrow due to fringing being more uh, significant or less significant. And um, I guess that's not the best I could answer that one. Next question, how does the surface roughness cause losses? What's the loss mechanism? Um, yeah, what that is is really skin depth related. So at very low frequencies when you have a thick skin depth, uh, then the majority of the RF current is residing in the copper, bulk copper, and also some of the surface roughness. Once you get to high enough frequency where the skin depth is the same dimension as the copper surface roughness, then the current density is mostly residing in the roughened area. And that roughened area is going to be, well, for one thing, it's going to be less copper because as you go up in frequency, the skin depth is thinner, so now you actually use less copper. And less copper means more conductor losses, more insertion loss. And when it's roughened like that, that does cause more insertion loss, more conductor losses too. But it really comes down to skin depth related to the surface roughness. As the skin depth is less than the copper surface roughness, the roughness will have a much bigger impact on the conductor losses. And also that roughened copper is using not pure copper. It's used an alloy of some type, and that's purposely done for thermal robustness and other issues. So it's not pure copper. It's pretty close to conductivity of copper, but it is usually a little bit less. So that's really the bottom line for how the copper roughness has an impact on conductor losses and ultimately insertion loss. Which method gives you the most accurate loss? Well, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> if it's a if you're testing raw material, and you're wanting to look at the loss, like the dielectric loss of the uh, dissipation factor or tan delta, uh, boy, each test method has pros and cons all over the place. It's really hard to to answer that one. Except I'd say waveguide is probably the better way to go, but it's more difficult to get done accurately just because of all the accurate things that have to be put together to get it to work right. But I think a waveguide test is probably one of the more accurate ways to get the losses of the material itself. As for losses of the circuit, then that gets kind of tricky because you have a lot of circuit fabrication influences too. And as a general statement, a microstrip circuit has less, is less influenced uh, for RF performance anyway by the circuit fabrication process as compared to granical planar waveguide or strip line. So strip line, you have the effects of um, 
the pre-preg layers and multi-layers being blended together and also trying to get vias so you have a signal uh, that's buried, uh, you have access to the buried signal. Kind of co-planar waveguide, I went through a bunch of that in this presentation where you can have effects due to copper and copper plating thicknesses and final plate appearances and things like that. So for circuit testing, usually uh, a cleaner way of doing that to get the losses more accurately, I think, is microstrip. And then for material testing, I'd have to say waveguide would probably be the more accurate way to go. Okay, next question, and we'll probably write this up soon, is what was the effect of the ENIG on dielectric loss? Um, in theory, it should be nothing. Um, and I, I say that hasn't something. <laughs> but for a, a microstrip circuit uh, and you're applying a metal to it, you're actually affecting the conductor losses and not the dielectric losses. And I'm not 100% sure that the dielectric losses are not impacted by that somewhat just by the process because the dielectric at the surface is actually affected by some of these chemistries. And the fringing around that could actually affect certain substrates. I think all the substrates that Rogers offers will not really, our substrates really not affected by that chemistry, but it is possible that some substrates at that surface right next to the conductor could actually be affected by the chemistries and then the dielectric losses are impacted. But the metal itself, the final plated finish, should just be uh, really contributing to the conductor losses only and not the dielectric losses. Okay, we still have a bunch of questions here. What we'll try to do is get back to people via email as best we can. I'd like to thank John for today's webinar and Rogers Corporation for sponsoring it. You can find out more about their products at their website. Note that this webinar has been recorded, so it will be available to watch later on today. You'll find it in the events section of the Microwave Journal website. If your colleagues would benefit from watching it, please let them know. And we thank everybody for joining us today.